Philippians, and we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, 1 through 8, and I titled the message, Through It All, uh, because I thought it might be a, not necessarily because of the song, but because of, of what Paul is saying here in different places, that through it all, we ought to work together in unity, that through it all, we ought to rejoice regardless of our circumstances, and through, through it all, we ought to be people of prayer. But listen as I read out of Philippians 4, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Euodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things or think on these things. Well, the reason Paul is writing this letter, this section of scripture, is because of the altercation that is ongoing in the church. And we see that in verse number two. He said, I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. He does not spell out what the differences are between these two ladies, but evidently it's gotten to the point that there are problems in the church. And he used the word implore. So he was wanting to get the attention of both of the women. I implore you, Odia. I implore Syntyche. Be of the same mind in the Lord. And uh, uh, he went on and he spoke about several different things, but the word implore, the way he is using it here, I do not think there was a doctrinal problem here because you read Paul's other writings and where there's a doctrinal problem, he spells it out. He spells out what the wrong belief is and what the right belief is. I think this was more some pettiness. I think this was more more of a uh, molehill being made into a mountain situation. And it might be that, you know, uh, if, if we were talking about a church today, it might be, uh, if you were going to put the forks in this drawer or if you were going to put the knives there. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, uh, you know, churches fight for hours in a board meeting as to whether they were going to remodel the kitchen and go with a gas stove or an electric stove. You know? And the guys that worked for the gas company wanted the gas stove. So, but what we need to remember is frictions and factions are ungodly distractions, and we do not want to get to the point to where somebody needs to write us a letter and say, get your act together. Uh, but notice something else in this passage of Scripture. They use the, the, the phrase, the book of life, and before I move on, uh, that is a phrase that is found several different places in the Bible, you know, where uh, you know, the name being written in the Lamb's book of life and all of that. But the dissensions and the factions in this church was something that Paul felt like he needed to address. Now, in Romans 16, verses 17 through 18, he said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create dissensions and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learned. And in this case, he's speaking about doctrinal differences. But people who teach contrary to what Paul had taught them, Paul says, avoid them, for these are the kind who do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by their smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of the naive. So, you know, Paul is saying, avoid these people. He didn't say that about Euodius and Syntyche. He said, ladies, he said, let's get this worked out. And, And by the way, he called on... Uh, called on his yoke fellow or his fellow in the ministry to, to help resolve the situation. There's been a lot of speculation on who that was. It could have been Epaphroditus because he had been sick and Paul was sending him back to the church. Perhaps Paul did not mention who his yoke fellow is so that when he wrote the letter, everybody might be thinking, hey, Paul is talking to me about getting in here and helping, helping resolve this problem. 
So he might have been very clever in not mentioning a name. But the dissensions and the problems and, and the factions in the church, in the 1750s, the British and the French were fighting over Canadian territory. And the British had a commander, an admiral by the name of Phipps, who arrived at Quebec before all of the British troops arrived. So he, his orders were to wait out into the wait at the bay until the troops came in and then support them. Well, while Phipps is out there, he's, he's seeing this cathedral and it had, it had statues of all of these saints on the side of the, of the cathedral and on the towers. And for some reason, it angered him. So he ordered for his cannons to be fired time and time again and to hit that temple and to knock those statues off to destroy it. Well, the troops arrived. They tried to attack the French, and you know what happened? The admiral had already shot all of his ammunition up trying to kill the saints that were on the side of the building. And I tell that story to say this. That's a mistake that many Christians make is we focus on destroying other saints instead of our real enemy. And so we need to be cautious on that, and I think Paul was trying to address that issue. In 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 11, Peter said to sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile and let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Peter was saying basically the same thing that Paul had said earlier in Philippians and was kind of a reference to these two ladies we do not want to be known as murmurers and grumblers, but we need to be re remembered as people who genuinely love the Lord and want to serve Him. Well, that was the altercation. So let me point out the alternation, the change in focus that Paul gives. Instead of fussing and fighting and fuming, Paul says, we need to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That passage of Scripture, Philippians 4.4, 4, is one that is memorized by many people around the world. Charles Spurgeon once said, Joy in the Lord is the cure for all discord. And this rejoicing that Paul is speaking about and Spurgeon is referencing is not one of those hakuna matata moments of the Lion King or the smarmy phrase, uh, don't worry, be happy. Happy is, emo is an emotion that changes with the circumstances of life. But the joy of the Lord and rejoicing in Jesus Christ is the fruit of a relationship of abiding in Christ. You know, our lives will change and our circumstances will change, but the Lord Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Zephaniah 3.17, we're told, The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. Now I want you to listen to this. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will bring you quietness with his love. He will delight in you with shouts of joy. Have you ever thought about God delighting in you and shouting over you? You see, the object of our rejoicing is our good, all-loving, all-powerful, all-wise God who never changes, therefore we can rejoice in Him. When Nehemiah was rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, he reminded the people that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And it's this joy, the joy of the Lord, that activates our attitude, which brings me to the next point, the activation in Philippians 4, 5. Paul said, let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. We don't have time for the decision, uh, dissension, we don't have time for the pettiness. Rejoice in the Lord and let your gentleness be known to everyone. And the word gentle means to be reasonable, to be judicious, not malicious in your relationships. In 1 Peter 2.11, Peter said, I urge, and that's the same word Paul used when he said implore, I urge you or implore you to keep away from fleshly desires. And it is those fleshly desires that we really pride as a fleshly desire that was causing the friction between Syntyche and Yodius. 
He says, I urge you to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul and maintain good conduct among the Christians so that, uh, that though they now malign you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God when he appears. You know, over the years, I've heard more than one person say, you know, I just don't want to go to church because of all those hypocrites. I usually tell them, well, come ahead. We've got room for one more. But, uh, but, but you know, people have a tendency to see what might be negative and use that as an excuse not to come. And Paul is saying we need to, they need to see us rejoicing and they need to see us as being gentle and not being involved in the works of the flesh. Uh, and uh, Matthew 5, 16 said, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the question is, is what do people see when they look at us and evaluate our lives Monday through Saturday? And Paul reminded these people that the Lord is at hand. And that doesn't mean at hand like you're sitting beside somebody in the pew, but it means that we need to be aware of the day and the hour in which we live and view the world through the lens of Jesus' soon return. Rejoicing in the Lord is easier when we're looking for Christ. We're more apt to show gentleness to others if we believe he could come at any time. Uh, when we know Jesus and we know him as our Savior and we know that he will return and we can know that he is going to right all wrongs and settle every unsettling situation, we can be more gentle expecting Jesus to make everything right. Then the arbitration in Philippians 4, 6. Paul said, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God which surpasses all understanding, and that, that will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, the Greek word for anxious is, is interesting. It means to be pulled in different directions. It means our hopes pull us in one direction and our fear, fears are pulling us in the opposite direction. It's the old English root that means to strangle you. And that's when people have an anxiety attack it feels like they're suffocating sometimes. And so Paul said, be anxious for nothing, and instead, by prayer and supplication, let, give God all of your requests. You know, if, if I had a blank piece of paper, and I'll just do it this way, this would be a list of what you should be anxious for. There's nothing there, is there? And that's because... When we are in tune with God and we were walking in step with him, and, and I'll reference the Sunday school lesson, when we are wearing the armor of God, we don't have to be anxious for anything because we know God's already got the solution. We just need to lean on him and depend on him and pray for everything. There is nothing too small that is outside of the purvey of God. There's nothing so inconsequential that we cannot pray about it. That's what he says here. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Praying for yourself, praying for others, doing it with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made, to, be, uh, be made known to God. And what's the result? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus the Lord. Now think about the peace of God. In Romans 5, verses 1 through 5, Paul says, Since we've been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God. Now what Paul is speaking about here, the peace with God, is, is what we have when we become a Christian. The peace of God is what Paul was speaking about in, in Philippians 4, and that's the peace that we have with our relationship with the Lord Jesus. But in Romans 5 he says, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained access into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. Not only this, but we also rejoice in suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance character, and character hope. And he says, hope does not make us shame, uh, does not make us ashamed, and does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And when we go to, go to God in prayer, our anxious thoughts can leave, because his presence fills us. Now, notice the aspiration in Philippians 4, 8. 
Finally, brethren, he's wrapping things up in this letter. He says, instead of being anxious, instead of thinking about what, how somebody has wronged you, he said, think about these things. He said, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there is anything that is praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. Now, he's giving us something that we need to fill our minds with. You know, we, there is so much trash out there in the world, if we're not careful, that is what is going to fill our minds and leave us an anxious and full of anxiety. Listen to what Paul said in Corinthians 10 about thinking and the way we ought to manage our minds. Paul said, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And here's how you do it. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. When you find yourself thinking a thought that you know is contrary to the principles of the Bible, you need to take it captive and quit thinking it. Because you can only think of one item at a time. And so when you begin to think about the negative, you go back over here to Philippians, and we begin to need to fill our minds with thoughts that are pure, lovely, and of good report. Things that are true and things that are noble, not the trash of the world. And one of the better known verses about meditating is Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. That's how we take take thoughts captive. When we fill our mind with the things of God, we eliminate the anxiety of the world. But you shall meditate on God's word day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. You know, like a fire alarm or a smoke detector, when we meditate on God's word, it alerts us to what is wrong. Deplorable and horrible imaginations lead to distorted and contorted thinking. That's why we need to meditate on God's word and take our thoughts captive. Now, you know, when I, when I think about what Paul said about the things that are noble and just and pure and thinking about those and about the, the way the word of God alerts us, Psalm 19 came to my mind as I was prepping for this sermon, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, and notice what it does, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them your servant is warned, and in keeping of them is great reward. You see the need of thinking about what is right and how God's word are those principles that we need to fill our hearts and minds with. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verses 14 through 16 and verse 165. He said, I've rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. He valued that as much as all riches. And notice what he says. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. The way that we walk in step with God and take the stand that he wants us to take and get through it all is by rejoicing in him, abiding in him, being of a gentle nature and filling our hearts and minds with the things of God instead of the trash of the world. Would you bow with me in prayer? Well, Father, I pray that the word of Christ will dwell in each of us richly so that through it all, through the peaks and the valleys, through the highs and the lows, through the good times and the tough times, Father, I pray that each of us can follow in the footsteps of Jesus and live a life full of love, and live a life, Father, so that we're a blessing to those around us, so that we can keep rejoicing in you, and they might as well. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we get ready for a song of invitation. I invite you to come.